Let, let me start this webinar. Uh, I'm so delighted that uh, you have all joined us for If These Walls Could Talk. 2020 has been an extremely profound year. Um, it's been a time of plague. Um, and um, like everything in my life, I've, I've sort of fell down the rabbit's hole. Mm -hmm. We started with Lal Jadu that me and Sarah curated, uh, which was a performance show uh, in a in a semi-abandoned building on IIH and Riga Road, which is our Wall Street. It was a, and then we had to close down the show, Lal Jadu read magic because of, the, because of the onset of the virus. Mm -hmm. And thus began what I call my Corona Chronicles. And mm -hmm. then after that, uh, we were all in lockdown. Karachi went under severe lockdown. And then me, Sarah and Adam Fahim Majid curated a virtual show performance of over 85 artists, which, uh, and we called it the Trojan Donkey. After that, I, did, I was compelled to do a performance work of my own, The Healing. And then we ended with If These Walls Could Talk. Uh, the lockdown in Karachi was lifted on August 10th. Our show was on August 18th. Uh, however, uh, us being extremely paranoid that the virus still very much is here, uh, we decided to follow extreme SOPs so people would come in the cars, watch the show and leave. Um, and it was the culmination of the Corona Chronicles. It is so important, I think, at a time like this, that the world should talk and we should speak to each other. We should get different points of view. Uh, the whole idea of the show was there were videos, uh, video works and film works around three minutes each. And we presented them one after the other and they were divided into sections. And the idea was to get a kaleidoscope. There was no, there was no other than, it was a general point of view, a sort of a paranamic point of view, a global <laughs> 21 artists from all over the world presenting their points of view. Sarah? Yeah, so pretty much uh, just as Amin has just outlined it, it was exactly that. Um, and I, I believe Amin very aptly puts, his, uh, puts it as the Corona Chronicles. Um, and to be fairly honest, and on a side note, I think this has been one of my most constructive few months aside of not just being stuck in lockdown, but as a whole as well, because it was literally one show after <clears> another. <throat> um, and then of course, you know, after Lal Jadu that we had, which was a, a you know, show of a local artist, and then went on to Trojan Donkey, where we started experimenting more and we expanded more. And it was not just local artists, but international artists. Uh, Amin had his performance uh, in his gallery, which was up on the roof, which was healing too. Um, and, and, I, I'd like to say as much as it might have been cathartic for him, it really was for all of us as well to be a part of it. And thanks to Mean, Thank you to, for participating. to, to, to uh, let us be all a part of it. It really just connected us um, in what was going on. And then to end it with this show right now and right here with uh, If These Walls Could Talk. Um, I, you know, even if the lockdown was easing, etc., I, you know, we were we were following all the SOPs, um, and then we had the classic look into you know the the drive through, and this time it was not just a quintessential performance art show, but it was a new media show with not just performances but also video works of artists from all over the world, uh, all over the world, um, and um, here we are now. Yes. <laughs> What I mean, like I said, so perfectly puts it as um, the Corona Chronicles. Yes, and uh, and Aisha Beg Mahmud, uh, who very kindly gave us the premises of the village mm -hmm. restaurant, all the artists, um, because we, uh, you know, we don't have any funding yeah. over here, yeah. very generously yeah. provided the works for free, mm -hmm. and and Pommy uh, uh, Goher, who's who's the with us director. right now, the event director, mm -hmm. who managed to organize this event and managed to make sure that there were no hitches and mm -hmm. moved as smooth as silk. <clears throat> um, um, on that note, I'd also add, I'd like to add a little bit of a note of thanks to all of you guys, yes, as all the artists. You. I mean, thank you, thank you. 
you. Thank you so much for all the support, for, you know, being a part of these shows and not only you guys, but also, you know, the writers who wrote for the catalogs. And then, of course, Muniba Rashid, who also did the layout. Then there was, of course, Bilal Ghori, who did the video work. And then uh, Homi, uh, Homi Irani, Hormoz Irani, who did all of our, who was helping us out with all the tech uh, where we're butterfingers help us to do a very smooth and seamless journey. <laughs> so a huge shout out. And, and of course, of course, and I cannot forget John, who I cannot thank enough <laughs> for reading over and over and over again and making sure that each one of our shows had a catalog that he would proofread to the T, yes. right? So yes, and, and I mean, no, no, really, John. okay, I'm going to give an informal introduction, which will be followed by formal introductions by Sarah. Yeah. I'll begin with Ruhi, who's my fellow sculptor, who used to be in Karachi, Pakistan, but now has left us for the United States. She just she was drawn towards the climate, I suppose, and has done fantastic work, is formalist, conceptual, and has a really unusual point of view. Then I'm like, then there's Richard, who actually came down. I met him about how many years ago, Richard? 25 years ago? 25 years ago. No, 25 years ago. Oh. <laughs> hey, he's still young. He's still young. <laughs> and, and, and Richard did a fantastic piece for us for the Karachi Biennale, and I was so happy to host him here. Nadia uh, Kabalinki and Tibo uh, Kabalinki, um, uh, both fantastic artists that I met in Berlin when I was doing a reconnaissance to try to find artists for the Biennale in Karachi, the first one. And it was wonderful because I went to their place and I got sucked into the energy and I was supposed to just be there for a short period of time. But the magic of their home and the magic of the personas just, just seduced me. And I, just, I was just so drawn towards them, their trajectory and their point of view. <coughs> and and last, too, too, I mean. <laughs> and last but not least, my beautiful Nayan Kulkarni, who came down for Wassel, which uh, Ruhi and I were both part of. And I was one of the uh, founders of this residency in Karachi way back in the day, around 20 years ago. And I did a performance work in my father's museum. We had the opening, we had the seminar of the, uh, of the workshop in my dad's museum whilst they were alive. And Nan created this wonderful performance work. We washed sequins off his face. Well, I love you all. <laughs> and now I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah to give uh, a more coherent introduction <laughs> to you all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Amin. And first and foremost, we shall have Ruhi Ahmed. Now, Ruhi Ahmed is a multidisciplinary artist. Her art practice encompasses sculpture, installation, mixed media, printmaking, and video. Ahmed also holds an MFA from the University of New South Wales, Sydney. She has been practicing and teaching art for over 30 years. She has exhibited widely, both locally and internationally, and her prolific works have been widely acclaimed. Emmett recently moved to the U.S. and now lives in Raleigh um, and see she works between Raleigh and Karachi. And now I shall give the floor to you, Ruhi. <laughs> hey everyone, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, um, Ruhi. Um, I think I'll briefly talk about um, my journey uh, with the walls and uh, the borders that have been a narrative of my work for the last 20 years or so. I have been looking at uh, um, political, social boundaries <coughs> and borders that have existed cartographically. And I have been investigating them and making them part of my narrative within my art making. Um, Exploring those, I just sort of, as I was sort of investigating, I found out that the boundaries are not permanent and uh, they, they transform and metamorphose and change depending on which side you are looking from, which perspective you are looking from. So the politics is involved, um, uh, society is involved and uh, Going through those and making my own maps of uh, an alternate boundary 
within a cartographic boundary. Uh, I also realized that uh, boundaries and walls are first and foremost formed within ourselves, <clears throat> within our minds. So physical boundaries come later, but it's the um, non-physical boundaries that we as human beings love to build around us, the walls either for security or confinement. And uh, these walls constantly travel with us. We pull down some and we build some others. And these walls are much more, um, I would say dangerous or effective than the physical walls that we, we sort of uh, uh, see around us. Now, connecting that to my, my sort of uh, time here uh, in US, as soon as I came to US, Corona virus happened, COVID happened. So becoming confined within the physical walls <laughs> of the house, my studio, I think the, 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 my difficulty and the people that I was talking to, their difficulty was more, I felt facing themselves rather than you know that confinement that confinement to some was a positive thing depending on their frame of mind and they got more time to work they, they got time uh, to uh, <clears throat> spend with their family which can be things that they would not normally do but for others it was it was very frustrating and uh, um facing your own demons, the circle that I was talking to, I think that was the very difficult thing that uh, people uh, found out, time to spend with yourself, facing yourself. So like, like one of the videos, you know, running away from yourself, I think one of the artists in this, uh, you know, um, oh exhibition. And I thought it was constantly like that that you were trying to not face yourself, your inner demons. Um, and this, this, uh, these COVID walls kind of forced you to look at those and maybe address those. So um, my, my uh, video where I am stitching into the palm of my hand is a very introspective piece where you are constantly dealing with your um, ongoing life and yet you are also trying to build in a narrative uh, trying to sort of bring in things that are that have not been faced by you up till now so uh, so um, um, all of that sort of is part, it becomes part of your memory. So things that are there and I'm sorry, I have to be also very nostalgic because <laughs> of course, of course, a lot of Karachi and I am sort of uh, looking at my life from a distance, which mm -hmm. I have spent all this time and sort of re-looking at it and, and uh, sort of uh, bringing some into myself and taking out some and what to keep and what not to keep. But um, like the dotted lines of the uh, map, I feel that at least this uh, technology, uh, the Zoom and the internet technology gives us those uh, uh, spaces in between the dashes of the line where we can <clears throat> and connect with each other. Um, yeah. No, that's so true. Um, and I and I especially feel like with what you just said, I, I feel like migratory aesthetics really gives you the ability to extract yourself from where you are and be able to look back in retrospective as uh, opposed to being in such close proximity of where you are in, where everything just seems in the normal until you know you get out of that situation and you're able to look back and be able to see where you're from or 
you know, all these issues, you know, and, and nostalgia plays a huge, huge part into it. Um, once you're able to look back and you realize yeah. the fragments of the life. quote Kalima's uh, thing that you have in the catalog is that right now is the time when the sounds of silence are all around us. Absolutely, Ruhi. And I, what I think what you said was so beautiful is that the walls we draw separate yes. us, especially <clears throat> like this, when there's so much polarization. This doesn't seem to be a middle ground. We should be aware of the walls we create ourselves. For sure. For sure. Sarah? That's for sure. Thank you so much, Ruhi. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and we shall now go on to our next panelist. And that is Richard Human. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, Mr. Richard Human, a little bit yes. of introduction. Um, everyone, Richard Human is a New York City based American neo conceptual artist. His art delves deep into concept, into concept and ideas, and he uses a multitude of materials to create his installations, sculptures, videos, <laughs> and sound pieces. He has had multiple national and international solo gallery and museum exhibitions. And now I shall give the floor to Mr. Human. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. How are you? Hello. And, uh, hi. Um, so with my work, um, with this particular piece, um, what I've done is when, when Amin approached me first with the idea of if these walls could talk, my first thought is, it, you know, that's an expression as if like it's a witness where the walls are witnessing what's happening inside a room, right? And ultimately it's a silent witness. So the movies were silent. I'm, I'm not necessarily a filmmaker per se, but I have ideas, conceptual ideas, which I then turned into film early on in the, in the lockdown here uh, for the Trojan donkey, I created a, 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 a three minute video uh, based on a piece by John Cage because New York was locked down, America was completely locked down. And I was, although I live in Brooklyn, I was at my house in Woodstock for a couple of months, simply because I had the ability there to walk around a little bit. And I was hearing this, everything was quiet, the sounds of nature, the sounds around me. But this piece that I created here, which is called Breakable, is the polar opposite of that. This is about the, what's happening in America at this time. And, you know, what's happening, in America right now is not new to places in the world. It's just a little bit new to us. We haven't seen anything like this in 40, 50 years. Um, and what happened on January 6th in America here with basically a, an attempted insurrection and, and uh, of our capital. But anyway, so when, when I had the idea for this piece, I thought about, you know, the idea of graffiti. I, I'm not a graffiti artist and I don't necessarily like or dislike graffiti, I understand it's a form of expression. Um, but my nephew, who happens to be in the movie, my brother's son, he's the, the star of the movie. He he's very much into graffiti. And I thought, well, graffiti is this methodology of really expressing ideas. And um, so I went around and I filmed in Brooklyn, I filmed in Bushwick and Greenpoint where I live and Manhattan and um, captured these things that we're talking at that time about the coronavirus, about the political, uh, the, the feelings in America politically right now, that it's a, it's, a, it's a real like boiling point in America, as you can tell. And we filmed this a few months ago, not knowing what would be happening right now, but there was a sense that it might just happen. Um, so, you know, ultimately what happens in, in the movie is I, I go back and forth, I follow him uh, which his name is Jared in the movie. He's the star. He's a, a 15 year old, he's my 15 year old nephew, where he cuts out the symbol of America on, on a stem, which is kind of the symbol for breakable or fragile. Uh, generally it's a broken glass as the symbol. I created the symbol for America breaking. And uh, he goes around and rides his bicycle to Williamsburg where I live and then uh, spray paints that on a, on a wall with other graffiti and at the very end of the movie, he then crosses off the word breakable, meaning we're not breakable. We may be a little fragile right now, but we, in fact, will get through this. And, and we're getting through it right now, quite honestly. You know, the, the P and I, I'm not a political artist, so it wasn't as if like I do political art at all, but it just seemed really like timely at that moment, you know, to, to make something like this. And uh, again, you know, very happy and very also honored 
to be a part of the the, uh, the piece that you guys did. And I thank you for that. Um, I have wrote down a couple notes here. I think I crossed. I got all my notes down. <laughs> Yeah. You improvise very well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I, I, I was just gonna say, I there's such bizarre times that we're in. I don't think that any of us would have probably anticipated being in such a situation. And um, they've called for a very strange, unprecedented uh, reaction to not just the audience but also to artists to the audience, um, and it's sort of dictated our practices in a very strange manner to the times again. So, yeah. So well, yeah, I mean, especially here, again, you know, whatever side of the political aisle you're on, you would never expect to be in a lockdown. Yeah. So many people unemployed since the Great Depression. Uh, basically, a sitting president calling for an insurrection against the own government that he runs. Yeah. Uh, the feelings on both sides of, you know, the far left and the far right. I, never have we witnessed quite anything like this before, yeah. you know, and, and uh, it's as an artist, I try to tune all of that out for the most part. I go in my studio, I lock the door and, and I don't listen to any news or anything, but it's impossible once you, once you walk to the studio in the morning or walk away, not to be a part of this, you know? Absolutely. And Richard, you know, don't just show sort of the strange magical power of art. Yeah. Because you did this piece before August 18th, Richard. Yes. At that point, it was Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And those were the people coming out on the streets and protesting. Yes. And now there's been a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. And you know, Absolutely. the capital was gone. And when, when the boy spray, spray paints an X on Fragile, it was so moving, yes. it's so pathetic, Richard. You know, it's so prophetic, Richard. Uh, you know, you know. So, thank you so much. I, I must be honest. That was the last second decision. When I had done the script for the movie, he, we were just going to leave it as, as you right. know, breakable or fragile. Right. And at the very end, as we were filming, I, I said, you know, Jared, I said, Jay, grab that paint. Let's get keep him in frame. Let's grab that, go back and cross it out and walk away. And it just literally happened instantaneously on the moment we kept it, and that, and that's how it ended up being. And it, it is, you know, we're going to have a hopefully Wednesday. It may get a little dicey, but we'll have a peaceful transfer of power, which is what yeah. we're about. Yeah. And and hopefully, it may be maybe like unsettled for the next couple of months, but hopefully, we'll get back. We've survived f worse than this, and we'll we'll get through this. That's you know, not just us, but the whole world. You know, Richard, a huge shout out to your you know your fifteen year old nephew Jared also for being a part of this and also being able to understand and comprehend the situation that we're in and the ambiguity and the ambivalence that we're stuck in, not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, not just, you know, politically, but also with the whole Corona uh, you know, virus and everything and the situation that we're all stuck in. But absolutely in the big picture. Absolutely. And, you know, he's a, he's a cool breeze dude, Jerry, <laughs> you know, so he was like cool through the whole thing. But what also I'd like to thank him about is, <laughs> And he helped me. The, the world he's yeah. gonna inherit. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck to you. I don't. I don't do. For me, I don't do graffiti. So our idea. I worked with George Lagrange. He edited this and worked with me. And uh, I, I don't know graffiti. So my thought was, we'll just do this. And he's like, no, that's not how we do it. So he actually. What it was also like, out in the end. <laughs> he was on set helping us figure out to make it look as realistic as possible. You know. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we shall now go on to introducing Nadia Kabilinki. Nadia Kabilinki was raised in Tunisia, Ukraine, and the United Arab Emirates. She graduated from the University of Fine Arts, Tunis, in 1999 and earned a PhD with honors at the University of Paris and Sorbonne in 2008. She now is residing in Berlin, and Kiev Kabilinki has a personal history of migration across cultures and borders that has greatly influenced her work. Nadia? Hi. Hi, Nadia. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> uh, a, a very brief introduction to our collective, actually, and behind Nadia Kabilinki, uh, there I'm, is Timo. Yeah, so. I know that. Timo's going next. <laughs> You're separate. <laughs> You're separated from us. <laughs> <laughs> 
screen. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying this because we actually are an invisible collective. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> we, we thought we'd get Timo his 15 minutes of fame separately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But, uh, you wrote us the program. Yeah. Uh, I guess um, it, it's not a. Um, um, Don't say it. It's just to say that behind yes. this name cool. are two people, cool. Cool. and it's original. That's why I wanted to introduce it. I don't think there is. This is something that people meet every day. It's a decision that we take to commonly, and even if it's one name, so you will uh, later introduce him as Timo Kabilenki, but he's part of Nadja Kabilenki. This is what I wanted oh. to say. <laughs> I mean, on, that, on that note, um, we would like to add that both of them, Nadia and Timo, both do work as a collective as well. Um, this is what I would say. Even if we are going to be introducing them separately, um, most of their work is a collaboration between the two. A very fertile exactly. collaboration. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. But this being said, of course, Timo has his own activities. He's yeah. a writer and... Uh, 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 sociologist, he will speak about himself, but I'm here in the context of the collective, yes. Um, yeah, uh, what can I say on which levels? On the level of the, uh, since the Corona, the COVID-19 uh, came, uh, things changed, of course, but from my point of view, um, it was all expectable somehow, maybe not in the exact time and moment. But, uh, you know, when you take the space of animals completely, destroy their forest and the space of living, many um, virologists already predicted that pandemics will happen in the future, that this is a very delicate situation. And so uh, once we harm um, our earth on which we live, when we harm our home, our home can burn on our heads. It, for me personally, it seems like a very logical um, consequence of uh, the neoliberal way that just be of life which became worse to worse to worse and there is nothing that was it seemed like we're going against the wall and nothing was uh, uh, slowing it down so i don't know my hope is still that this virus will slow us down will wake us up as a people living on this planet and realizing that it is flat, fragile, beautiful place, but fragile. And if we want to survive, we better change. So, but if we want, it's not a problem either because earth existed before and it will continue and animals and every, it's only, it will be without us. So ultimately I'm not surprised anyways. One point. Uh, the other, maybe a coincidence, Timo, and I don't know if we predicted or it was a coincidence, last year, uh, this is almost like the anniversary, it was the beginning of January, we had an exhibition in Amman in Jordan that was uh, called A State of Resilience. A matter of resilience. Uh, sorry, A Matter of Resilience, thank you. <laughs> And uh, it was just, we just heard in Wuhan that there was uh, this virus happening. We didn't know that it would be a pandemic, of course. And uh, we thought at that time it would be like SARS, you know, it will stop on the level of China. But the exhibition was planned long time before. And one of the pieces in the exhibition was also called Das Kapital, from the title of Karl Marx, Epilogue. And the under title was A Fable About the End of an Era. Uh -huh. so, uh, again, <laughs> so, <laughs> the air was there anyways, and the exhibition ironically still going on because of all of the lockdowns, it was open probably two or three weeks and then uh, a man went in a total lockdown and until now it's closed. So this a small parenthesis about Corona, but to speak about the piece that we have uh, shown um, uh, in the silent with the silent walls. Uh, was a piece that we did long time ago. We produced it in uh, 2015? No, 2014. 14, 14. Um, and Timo and I thought this would probably be an appropriate piece because it is about expression, things that are being said without speaking. Mm -hmm. So it's a series of faces, uh, portraits, and uh, you really see faces. And this is a piece that we produced uh, in the context of uh, a building uh, in London. So we were invited uh, to make a work, uh, an exhibition at uh, a place called Mosaic Rooms. It's the exhibition space. 
And um, we decided with Timo to make a research about the building itself because it was not like an ordinary white cube space where you come in and you, you know, what you expect. It looked like a home of some wealthy person uh, from the Victorian times. So the place already uh, invited us to get, dig deeper and understand what's going on. And uh, it was a beautiful coincidence because we discovered that this home, that this house was built by, by Emery Kiralfi, who was the general director of uh, the Great Britain exhibitions. I will make it short because there's a lot of archival research behind <coughs> this exhibition and this piece particularly, but I want to just to say where it came from, the piece. So we, one particular exhibition was interesting for us. The one that was, I'm just looking at the poster just in front. <laughs> so the Greater Britain exhibition in 1899, uh, there were many pavilions. And one of these pavilions, it was uh, called, exhibition was called Savage, Savage South Africa. So, so what was basically done was to bring people from South Africa who we later realized were performers and actors and very educated people and who spoke many languages, etc. But they were presented to the general public as savages. And it was the time where also in France when they did before that the uh, uh, general international uh, universal exhibitions, they brought people from different places from the colonies to show them in an animal like way. Uh, so what was very peculiar in this, in the pictures that we saw from the, all of the archive is that they were put always in groups and dressed in exagger exaggerated way, what have they would consider it savages in a way that the personality, or I would go further, say the humanity of these people were taking away from them through the media. So the media was, were used at that time to transmit a particular idea. And of course, behind it, there was the idea of these people are savages in South Africa. So yeah. the English who are educated and uh, cult have culture, they should come and do wars to bring the, the right culture. All of it is based on digging on uh, diamond and gold and etc. So this is... Uh, what we decided to do is a gesture with Timo, is the artistic gesture is to take the portrait of, uh, not the portrait, the one picture and consider it as a family portrait and really select every person, so a face and put it then in the frame separately and so give it back their face because they have their own expression and through the face you can really have this kind of human communication and it's very close to, it's like eye to eye. And we wanted to get to a procedure that brought us to that time back in these times, because uh, in the 19 and 18, in the beginning of photography, it was very difficult to produce photography for every portrait. So families usually made family portraits, and then they would cut off the faces that they will carry as amulets or put in their. Uh, so there is like a kind of a very, um, it's a gesture that is also has tenderness of family, you know, cherishing. And we wanted to bring it to this Victorian language also with the portraiture, with all of this, you know, the circle, the oval form, etc. And we produced the whole series, which we call Faces. But the most interesting part of, um, not most, but one of the interesting parts is that it was almost impossible to get in the archives to find these pictures. Because in Durban, we found them finally, they were named falsely. They were named under what, what they were representing. So one of the images that we used was like Chief Julius with his wife. Chief of Julius. Chief of Julius. And, you see. And warriors. And warriors. And these people were not uh, probably not Zulus, not Matabele, not you know they were maybe they were after archival research they were all Christians and uh, you know as I said they spoke many languages so they were already very socialized with the Western uh, lifestyle but they were archived as what they were representing so this was a work also about what is representation how does you know, um, also colonial structure imposed itself in a way that reality is completely erased. So it, yeah. so the, the reality becomes fake or is forgotten. And now what takes over is uh, the narrative, 
which is becomes the reality. And in this sense, it is very contemporary. I think we pushed it today to a certain paroxysm yeah. where, uh, you know, the fake is the, 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 through the technology and the reality that Richard also was talking about what's going on in America. I think a lot of it has to do with these exaggeration with fake news and uh, exaggerating things that, you know, it's fears of people, but has no relation to the, to the earth, to what's going on really. Um, and I think so the one who's completely like much more knowledgeable than me in this uh, process is Timo, because he's <laughs> most of the uh, archival research. So uh, Sarah, if you introduce him, he's going to tell course, you so many insiders uh, things yeah, about sure. the process. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nadia. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, 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 no, and it's well, fantastic yeah. what you're talking about, Nadia, because uh, one thing I'd like to say is I saw some uh, very cheesy uh, Netflix show called Bridgeton, oh, yeah, which course. is about, and it's supposed to be kind of like under the pseudo progressive uh, overtones and it takes place in 18th century England where uh, all these Africans are nobility. And they kind of explain it by saying, oh, the king, this is a mad King George that he fell in love with a woman of color. And that's why the, the you know, the, the relationship is between the races is, is, is wonderful and suddenly they become so rich and it's sort of, it's sort of like this sort of romantic, almost disturbing revisionism, uh, seeing the world in the, the, the conqueror's eyes. Yeah. So Sarah, um, please introduce Timo. Yes. Um, I, and before I do, yes, you know, just like how Nadia and Timo, both of your works, it spoke about, you know, the power of framing and also what come hand in hand with that is the power of manipulation. Yeah. Um, and for, uh, further ado, Timo Kavalinki. Timo is a sociologist, writer, and photographer. Uh, Nadia Kavalinki is collaborator in many projects. He graduated from the Freie Universität Berlin uh, within uh, 2004 and published in several scientific, uh, scientific and culture-related uh, culture magazines about his ongoing research about contemporary impacts of ordinary technologies and their widespread distribution on the human understanding, as well as on themes related to politics and art. Timo, all yours. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, as you as you said, coming from the so sociology side, uh, um, as we found this image, we got very interesting in the narrative and the power of these kind of representations. Um, and um, these images were has been always shown as um, as kind of marketing tools. So it was um, it was already taken on the on the steamboat, the Goth. Um, so it was taken on the sea um, just to be developed um, once the sea arrived in the harbor of um, Southampton. Um, they um, wanted to diffuse to to spread the image immediately with the press. So um, they also filmed a, a kind of um, first um, performance, a ritual of the, um, of the actors. They all have been actors um, already in the harbor. And um, all this was just uh, marketing. It was a really quite modern idea of um, marketing the, the Savage South Africa performance with a lot of money behind because um, filming, developing, in a very short time and the kind of things it was at this time at 1900 it was the cutting edge of technology so um so there was money behind and um and um when we started digging a bit deeper we found out that um, the man um, who produced everything was um, cecil rhodes who uh, is, I think, a very good candidate for these kind of people whose um, statues will be taken off in the next years. Um, so these, he's um, still considered a honorable person in, 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 in the UK. And there is even a kind of um, whitewashing or greenwashing um, strategy with the um, Mandela Roads foundation so they connected the name of Cecil Rhodes to the name of Mandela just to, uh, to change a little bit the the meaning of and the history and the thinking of of both I think in in uh, our modern thinking we would not um, hesitate to call a person like Cecil Rhodes a warlord 
or an oligarch. So he has his paramilitary, he fought the, um, the indigenous people, he killed many, many natives, and just for diamonds and gold, that was, that was the main you know, mineral wealth, that was his main motive. And um, he hired um, a person called Frank E. Phyllis, um, who was a circus man, actually. He, was, he came from equestrian shows. Uh, very good horse rider and um, he uh, should um, make or produce this um, spectacle called Savage South Africa and um, since he was not very creative on his own he just copied the shows of William Cody Buffalo Bill shows oh. but um, in a different way so when Buffalo Bill was more interested in showing the possible friendships between um, natives and um, immigrants. Um, the idea of um, Frankie Phyllis was to show the people in England, the, the audience, just how savage South African natives are. So this is why all the um, pictures have, um, have this um, captions like Zulu warriors and the chief of Zulu and his many wives. <laughs> this kind of thing. So everything that is totally odd for Western civilization was put on the in the captions. Yeah. So um, I don't know if Zulu warriors ever existed in a historical um, perspective. I think it's a made up thing. Uh, these have been people of the Zulu tribe, yes. But um, as I know, they were um, weaponed with um, spears and, and shields. So like hunters, <laughs> it's rather like hunters than like warriors. So uh, wh whereas the, the, the army of Cicero, they had machine guns and all the, all the um, hard stuff. So the warriors were mostly on the other side. And um, so um, but, uh, when, we, when, we, when we did a bit more research on this, this is a political side of, the, um, of this event. Um, Cecil B. Rose was very um, um, criticized in, in England at this time because um, people at this time and the authorities, the colonial authorities, they knew he's um, doing everything he's do he does is just for his own profit and he's putting at danger and risk the um, the um, the uh, British um, settlers um, so he wanted to show that um, everything he did was necessary because um, they're dangerous dangerous South African people um, there and uh, he there was no other way for him to than the way than the Zulu was actually. So um, um, the, the person Nadja spoke about, Imre Kiralfi, he was not very happy with this um, show because he collaborated with Buffalo Bill in Chicago and he built together with William Cody the, um, the White City and these kind of things. And um, so he had a very different approach of how these kind of shows should be. So bringing together and not um, separating. <laughs> so, and uh, he was happy to, to close it down later um, at the first um, um, opportunity to do that. But, um, but a few months when the show was on, um, there were some interesting newspaper articles. Um, at the beginning, everything started with, wow, it's a tough show. You can see these savages and it's a spectacle and these kind of things. And then later, after a few weeks, the, the, the tone in the articles totally changed. They talked about it's very interesting to um, people. Um, there were some public arousals because the, the um, daughters of the wealthy and, um, and prominent London families, um, they got in, uh, in conversation with all these um, savages. <laughs> <laughs> and they and um, apparently um, totally different newspapers from a Dutch newspaper, a German newspaper, French newspapers had articles and and um, the, the the reporters always said, yeah, they speak fluently French, fluently Dutch, fluently German. How did they do this? Savages. <laughs> 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 
dedicated and highly skilled actors. <laughs> you know, on that note, I, think, I, I think your video really taught us, you know, like to question uh, authenticity of, you know, uh, of the archives. Um, I, and when it comes to archives, again, I'd like to give this man a complete heads up because, no, don't look at me quizzically, <laughs> with every show that we have turned out, he has taught me that we've got to document it as close to possible to what actually <clears throat> happened at that time. So that mm -hmm. say 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, hopefully, um, it will serve to be as a literal documentation, socio-politically, realistically of the times that we're in without being tarnished by any other viewpoint, but exactly to what it was at that point. Um, mm. also, yeah. Chima, you know, what I find really powerful and disturbing about both your works is how little things have changed. Yeah. You know, how yeah. the narrative, it's fall the fall narrative the tree, you know, right? Yeah. yeah. How little yeah. things have changed. Yeah. You know, it's not just in the 1800s. Or it's even to now. You know, how even right now, the narrative, especially when you're in the South, there's a narrative it's given. Also, even, even by the liberals, there's yeah. a certain narrative yeah. that you're sort of like compelled to fit you into. You're forced to, yes. You're forced yeah. to fit into. Yeah. And, and uh, in my perspective, the voices from the South, so with this, yes. the South, they're not heard. So it's like um, talking against the wall. Yeah. You know, so there's a... There's a <laughs> yeah. There's yeah. a certain idea how, um, or a certain mainstream opinion about it, a ruling um, stereotype. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, whatever the other side is saying, it's just, um, yeah, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, it's just, yeah, of course. <laughs> but then it stays like um, Zulu Warriors in the, yeah, in right. the KwaZulu Nata library, university library, without uh, research on what re this photograph really was. And um, lately we did a, um, um, a deeper research in collaboration with the uh, um, Savannah Univers uh, College in Georgia. Yeah. And um, we found the-, um, the, the Students uh, started the research about where we stopped. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah, they, that? Um, it's amazing, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when the curators invited us to do uh, the exhibition with the university it was directly, yes, let's involve the students. <laughs> And they really, really went far. It's great. And they really <laughs> digged a, bit, a little okay. bit deeper. And they they nice. found the embarking the embarking list of all the people on the steamboat um, uh, where the photo was taken. And um, as you can see on the photo, there's okay, you couldn't see it actually on the photo. But when we did the Trump scan, the high res Trump scan, and we could zoom into it, we could see the faces and the faces of these people bring you closer to the people. And then you see things that you cannot see in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a total shot, in a landscape shot like this. Yeah. So, and then um, when you look at the faces, you see a little bit um, the mixed feelings the, the people had when they did this photo. Mm -hmm. And since they were actors and performers, mm -hmm. so the question came up, why do they, why do they look that in this way on the, on the photo? Because um, it's, it's quite unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, but I, I guess they could not digest the fact that they would, were not even mentioned as passengers. For sure. Yeah. For sure. They were mentioned as um, fright yeah. in the list. And that's, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how that happened yeah, yeah. and how that is possible. Or I don't, uh, maybe some, uh, there's <coughs> the, the curious fact that the family of Frankie Phyllis was enlisted with um, six kids and relatives. Mm -hmm. So um, when you look at the steamboat and you look at the fright this boat had, it's clear that uh, there was no place for large <laughs> families, <laughs> that large families. So either they were just um, put into family relatives of the white people yeah. or they yeah. were considered fright. In any way, There's they were no not name. considered yeah. humans, passengers and persons. Mm -hmm. So exactly. it's... Both with the reality of Frankie Phyllis. And I would now like to introduce you guys to our next panelist, uh, Nayan Kulkarni. For those of you who aren't familiar with Nayan, his practice explores notions of identity, 
place and atmosphere with sound, video, and light installation and performance art. His work often grows from responses to specific sites and localities through extended engagements with its landscape and history. Currently, he is working in a forest in an ancient copper mine and is collaborating with historians, musicians, and rangers to create new work. Nayan? Hi. I, I don't know how to follow the, uh, the, the, the last presentation. It just reminded me of um, Shaka, <laughs> Zulu and, Shaka Zulu in the, and his innovation of the short spear. Um, uh, so I'm just going to reflect on that for a second, because I think it's, it's, it's brought something up, this idea of roads um, as a kind of technological supremacist um, who both had um, the kind of the unconscious will of colonialism as, a, as already loaded. So without the technology, the, um, the beginnings of a kind of neoliberal trajectory are expressed in an unloaded gun that is already fully loaded with a kind of um, global politics uh, and power. And although Shaka Zulu, who, who hegemonized uh, the, the Zulu nations, because there were multiple tribes and multiple complexities, through, um, through violence, mm -hmm. through technological violence with it internally, it just was 200 years too late to um, take on British colonialism. Um, so I'm kind of dwelling on that. But there, there is, there's something kind of really curious about this idea of... Um, how did you put it? Uh, this idea that uh, you 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 oh, you said something something about the face brings you closer. So when you when you zoom in, as we are zooming in, now I find the absolute opposite in the experience of the last year. I found uh, the research I was doing before uh, the coronavirus hit was was thinking about um, uh, I suppose this. Uh, the, this, this technology, this, this, this tool of um, mediation um, catching me in a kind of cycle of disembodiment. And my, my practice for decades has been always, um, however polite I try to be, I always return to the body. And sound operating in the stomach, not in the head, sounds um, a haptic relationship to space, people, and the, the coincidence of Trojan Donkey and then if wolves can talk, um, or I guess all of us were forced to, as Rui really said, confront ourselves in a particular way. And for, uh, in the first uh, cycle of uh, lockdown, I found it immensely liberating because I've been very, very busy and preoccupied. The second phase and the third phase and the subsequent kind of... Um, um, unfolding of American politics in particular, I was given the opportunity to become obsessed by American politics in a way which I could possibly have been under normal circumstances. And paying more attention to talking heads who I identified with in California, who I'll never meet. And I have actually no idea of their veracity, where they come from. So my, my global political, uh, my thinking about global politics has been influenced by a couple of 30 year olds who run the Young Turks website. And I couldn't help but uh, start to uh, rethink my, there's a piece by Nancy Holt and Richard Serra Boomerang. I don't know if you know the performance, the seminal performance. Uh, so essentially Nancy puts on her headphones okay. and a microphone and what she says is fed directly into her ear and she's trying to relate that experience to the camera. And that cycle of uh, inducted loops of, of I'm now narrating what I'm saying, she could sustain it, and she's highly skilled at that time. She could sustain it for about two minutes. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the, the closed cycle of communication meant she went into a kind of, uh, it collapsed. She didn't actually uh, go into any kind of distress, but she stopped being able to communicate or relate or represent the experience that she was producing internally. And that seemed to me, uh, going back to it, to be the, a kind of perfect model before coronavirus, which I was exploring. And then it became not a model for coronavirus, it became the very experience that we were in. So um, the, 
so the, the, this kind of idea of freedom in the imagination is then locked into the control of the mediating mechanism, which is precisely the kind of things I was relating to embodied architectural and civic spaces in my research. It's like it, 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 they, I essentially experienced having to be indoors all the time, I meant I had to force this, uh, this model, this loop model of induction into uh, a performance practice. Um, and I, I kind of, there's a, um, I'm being, sorry, I'm being, so, so I guess many of us have had uh, to face ourselves, face uh, a particular kind of fear of inactivity. And then many, many people I know have become super active, super busy, um, uh, with no let off. So I'm rehearsing 11 o'clock at night. I'd never have done that a year ago. <laughs> so the very idea of labor then becomes um, exaggerated as a kind of, as practice, I work, I try to avoid that kind of Marxist critique of labor, but nevertheless, I then become my own, my, my own bourgeois. I, I, I pump myself as hard as possible. And my identity then becomes, uh, becomes reformed around an idea of activity as a kind of labor. And um, I found that disturbing. Yeah. And um, I've also uh, found that uh, I'm willingly participating in my own diminishing cycle of body. Mm. And uh, so one could be flippant and say it's impossible to get pregnant through the screen, but it's also impossible to, to uh, just touch somebody's shoulder. Yeah. So some of my other friends who have found that had a very dist distressing time. There was no possibility of uh, the glance. So uh, all the detailed gestures that you kind of indicated to in the photograph when you close up, the haptic relationship, the glance, the sigh, the looking away, all fall out of a kind of communication. And um, uh, as you can see, I don't look at the screen because I find this unhuman. Right. I'm now looking directly at Tazim, but she has no idea that I am looking at this one person. And then I'm looking at Richard. And Richard would know that if we we're in the same room. So a kind of theory of digital relations kind of has been beautifully challenged by us. And yet we are paradoxically unable to do something. So I'm now talking to people in different time zones, in different seasons, all over the world, and yet I'm meeting nobody. Mm. And I found that, uh, so the performances I've been doing in the studio, I think were, the Tasty Juicy Mango was, was like an s and M piece <laughs> <laughs> with a colonial twist. For those of you who didn't see it, basically I, I bought in our local supermarket uh, in a global lockdown, I could access North, uh, West African mango. Mm -hmm. And I thought this is precisely the colonial subject, but the colonial object, you know, tasty, juicy mango. Turns out a rather interesting uh, musician also did a brilliant set on on the tasty, juicy mango as a kind of a, the, uh, the 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 colonial body being subject to the pleasure of consumption. And of course, they were unripe. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, they're, they're ripe, unripe, so they're dry as hell. So if you try to eat a mango in that condition, you will suffocate yourself, but with no. <laughs> juice right. <laughs> so there's no juice in that performance so um although i am not in my private life as it were not one that does do s and m i don't tie myself up it did occur to me that there was this other colonial subject which i hadn't addressed which is the, the inherent misogynist violence of this medium uh particularly as in this room yeah, this is a good room. So many rooms. I've, I mean, I've been, I've been effectively the the charcoal on the screen. This is a nice room to be in. This is an international room. I feel reassured. So um, I was thinking about Black Narcissus and uh, uh, the colonial subject, Black Narcissus, and then, uh, then of course, Palin Pressburger, and I thought, well, it has to be the red shoes, and. Uh, ha so I just wanted it to swing and swinging in live time and I punch it with some gloves. So uh, then of course, to make this work, I have to buy material. I buy material through Amazon and the red dancing shoes come from China mm. and the boxing love comes from Taiwan. 
<laughs> and um, so not in the performance, but in a kind of private rhetoric, I'm to produce the work, I'm using a whole system of exchange. So I'm double trapped. So I'm completely in, in, incarcerated in these, in, you just have to stop me, you know, I'll just keep going. It's like, so, <laughs> um, so where, where am I, where, where is my body? Right. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, this is possibly art rhetorical rather than experienced, but um, yeah, where is my body? So just to finish, um, I was lucky enough to um, meet a, a hunter recently. For a for a, a commercial forest to function, you have to stop the deer and the hares from destroying the young saplings. And one hare will take out acres of forest in a weekend. So this young man's job, which is under the living wage, is to uh, maintain the population of deer. And of course, the people have invited me to make a work are super sensitive about me talking about the forest being a place of culling and death. But there's been a hunter in this forest since for over a thousand years. He's responsible for looking after it. But his job is entirely in, on his own. He's, uh, and his job is uh, to kill a certain number of deer. period. He smells of blood. He's very clean, by the way, but you can't remove the smell of blood from, the, from the, his four by four. So one of the first haptic experiences I've had in a year with a new person as part of a project was tainted by the smell of blood. And when I was um, coming back from the forest, uh, I realised that's precisely what I miss it. Mm. The smell, not, not necessarily of blood, but the smell. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's me banging on too much. <laughs> no, Thank it's, you, it's truly profound, yeah. Dan. The loss of body, yeah. the sort of like complete, you feel alienated and separated. And even these sort of like Zoom kumbaya moments, um, uh, there's that you can't touch anybody. Yeah. Uh, and this. Well, there's, there's also a kind of, there was also a problem with, with the work I've been doing because up until basically the last installation I did before lockdown was, was a huge. Uh, immersive critique of the very of these very processes, right. turning them into a kind of spectacle of consumption and feedback. And the very next thing I had to do was kind of make something of the very thing I wanted to tear apart. I found that <laughs> <laughs> uh, before you uh, go to Tanzine Kayum, I just wanted to say a few personal words about her. I first met Tanzine uh, when she was coming down to the Biennale, Karachi Biennale, 2017, and I was just enamored by the power of this woman um, and her scale and scope of ambition. She wanted to sort of take over the facade of the Theosophical Society and cover it with this sort of like wallpaper of cockroaches that initially, I mean, they look very decorative, but when you approach them, they're these cockroaches covering the facade, the entire facade of the building. And um, uh, Sarah has gone to the loo, and so I will uh, introduce Tanzine Kayum. Tanzine Kayum is a Pakistani Canadian artist whose work addresses complex issues of belonging and displacement within a socio political context. Primarily trained as a miniature painter, she continues to explore new materials and processes through mediums such as drawing, installation, sculpture, video, and performance. Her work has been shown in galleries and museums around the world and is included in several publications and many private and public collections. I hand the floor over to Ms. Kayu. Thanks, Thanks, Amin. Hey, Billy John. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's lovely to be here today. And um, I was just thinking that I was actually part of all uh, three of your public presentations of the Corona Chronicles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's uh, you know, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to be a part of it. Thank you for being part of it. So, um, yeah, and I think all those presentations of yours were, um, you know, were presented at at the different stages of the uh, of uh, the, the virus, the pandemic, and how uh, you know it was evolving, and how um, 
we were evolving with it emotionally and uh, you know how our work was uh, responding to it so um i i um i relate a lot to what um, uh, you know nayan was talking about uh, and what uh, also ruhi uh, talked in uh, you know in great length about it's about facing ourselves right and uh, so i i believe this was more a time of for me as well like for self reflection and um, but interestingly i felt that there is this um, there's been this expectation i don't you know like a false expectation or people thinking that oh uh, artists must be doing a lot of work now you know because uh, we we're, we're enclosed in in the space and uh, we must be like constantly creating work but it wasn't it wasn't like that i mean um many of us many of the artists we already we already work in isolation i mean most of us but it is it is the the uh, you know it is the social interaction and uh, which is our muse it is what happens around us and you know uh, that is what affects our work and that changed drastically and so i mean each one of us responded to it as uh, nayan was putting uh, uh, you know it responded differently to it so i guess uh, like uh, when lal jadu happened uh, uh, similar like i was in karachi for my solo show which got cancelled on the day of the opening and i was on uh, one of the last flights leaving karachi to canada um and then uh, uh by the you know and then i had to once here i had to go through a 14 day self quarantine and you know in canada we do it really really strictly um so uh, it's um, so that was by at that time early Mar- you know late march and april was a very very alienating concept and very new concept of what is you know i social uh, the quarantine uh so i guess you know for me so emotionally i was it started with like caution and then uh, there was a sense of fear a lot of it and i think which has been central to mm-hmm. a lot of my other work too the sense of fear false or true uh so 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 for that so when in april you did the trojan donkey i responded with that performance piece where i and, and i were you know still just finished my quarantine so i had um I chose 14 objects uh from around my studio and my room and um, you know based on so how do you select 14 important objects uh so I you know is it based on memories is it based on uh, you know what they hold what their function is uh or your interaction with them so I chose that and I uh, in you know put myself in this 4 by 4 cube and uh, did that performance where I, I was interacting with these objects but not in a way what they were supposed to do so you know making them functionless yet exploring the limitation of our own body um and i think by the time we um, we came to uh, uh if these walls could talk so we were already in um, august right mm-hmm. yes and um so so i think by that um time things slowed down you know the 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 idea um and then for us uh, many people uh, you know started seeing this time or this past year as a as a transition i felt you know there was this sense of anticipation of what's going to come next yeah. or uh, you know a lot of people were we we started hearing this word the new normal mm-hmm. right what's what are the things we're going to keep and uh, so i feel a lot of people see this okay it's going to pass we uh, you know we're going to go into a new uh, way of living or uh, we're going to um, uh, you know reflect or change or so i was interested in that idea as well that is it is is it is that what's happening are we seeing it as a time of transition um so for the um, for the video that i did uh, you know the silent video for that piece is uh, is sort of a reflection of that um and i guess um so i wasn't i wasn't you know all of last year i wasn't producing a lot of work uh, like i mentioned before so for me i took this time to really really quiet and uh, you know experience that aspect of uh, my every day so you know to really go within have a conversation with myself and uh, so with that uh, you know i can say 
not like I was enjoying the solitude too, right? I mean, it's not it's not loneliness; it's it's solitude, and you know, you kind of you kind of embrace that, and um, uh, and I guess uh, one of the important thing, uh, which uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot of other people experience too, is also the realization of um, you know how uh, what is it that we hold important in life the realization of uh, who is important in life because you know we we limited by so many things now and then and then of course and how little we have in our control so all those all those real i think you know i spent time with that as well and um, uh, and if um, so, instead of you know like spending a lot of time producing work or thinking about you know what uh, I uh, want to create, I I started collecting words. So I I read I read a lot, and I would you know and also um, uh, you know listen to music. And God bless the artists. What we would have done without you know music, art, and uh, movies and uh, and books. Um, so you know from art being uh, considered as uh, you know by many as uh, as a luxury became an essential, I think. And um, so I, 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 I started collecting words uh, from various sources that I was exposed to. And I mean, some of you who already uh, know my work, I, <clears throat> I use words a lot. I draw, um, uh, you know, um, a single word or a phrase uh, in my performances and in my drawings. And I um, explore the power of the word, um, you know, uh, spoken or written or, or how we use it and, uh, you know, the power it holds uh, uh, on us. So, uh, and I, what I do is I, as you can see uh, in one of my drawings in the background as well. So I, I draw single words for hours at a time, uh, uh, creating these abstract forms and, uh, you know, resembling um, the, a spiral or a, uh, or a black hole or a, you know, a mandala kind of a, um, image uh, where, um, you know, the words are stretched and um, rhythmic and poetic and yet they maintain the legibility in some form. Um, and each of these words are, uh, uh, you know, like carefully selected for these works and uh, which, which kind of talk about my own uh, sociopolitical inquiry as well. And um, so I thought uh, that today I would um, just read a few of the words that I've collected uh, in the past many months, not many, just a few. Um, and then I'll, I'll just end at that. <clears throat> okay. So wild, misfit, stubborn, Deserve, teach, punish, sleepless nightmares, shiver, solitude, waiting, memory, trust, time, doubt, broken, reasons, action, loss, regret, test, pain, scattered, rain, chance, voice, liberty, privilege, path, shelter, Speech, power, change, justice, choice, void, violence, love, laughter, equality, normal, silence, saved, breathing. Thank you so much, Tanzi. I had the privilege of uh, the drawing that you see behind Tanzi mm. 
She does this also in a performative manner, but she does this in front of an audience. Yeah. And it is a very sort of mystic, wonderful experience <coughs> to watch her uh, immersed in that experience. Uh, uh, it's very um, hypnotic. Uh, hypnotic and might I say the word, use the word Sufi, where she's completely lost in, yeah. in this idea of repetition and meditation. Thank you, Tanzin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, right at this moment, um, uh, is Heidi happy? Has she joined us? Uh, uh, she was there initially. She was there. I don't know whether she's there yes. anymore. Heidi, hi. Hi, hi okay. Heidi. Uh, uh, <coughs> Heidi Hatfrey uh, very kindly wrote this very eloquent essay on, on walls and being of German origin. Walls is something that is, is quite profound for Heidi. Heidi, would you like to say something? Um, you don't I'd, have to, but it's good. <laughs> <coughs> I didn't uh, expect it all to, to talk and I have my uh, stepson has at the same time a, um, a poetry reading and I'm uh, uh, therefore a little, I didn't know how to do it and I was happy that I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't do anything here because I, um, I uh, did, was so torn between these two things. Um, um, why don't you give me a little time and oh. somebody else uh, talks first and I collect my thoughts for a moment and say something later. What about that? That sounds <coughs> wonderful. That sounds we, how, how long will we continue? Till yeah. Yes, yeah. so another 17 minutes. 17 minutes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love numbers. They give me comfort. I'm an old man. That's all I have left. Numbers. Okay. Uh, just five minutes. So, okay, so that fine, fine, okay. fine. Just jump in whenever you'd like. I do. Oh, it's, it's, it's incredible. And uh, also, okay, I, I'll take this moment to have full disclosure as well. I, I see Nadia and Timo uh, Kabelinke and, uh, and the partnership that they have. Well, me and John McCary, um, who I've been with for over 30 years, um, and he is the coordinator of my gallery. And it's an artist, you know, we live on top, the gallery's at the bottom, um, and it's a nonprofit space. But we've also collaborated. We don't have this sort of formal relationship. I, it would be too scary for me to define something like that. It'd be frightening. <laughs> we spend too much time together as it is. But uh, <laughs> I mean, I can really understand you guys when you talk about collaboration and, and being connected, yeah. uh, you know, on many forms and fashions. I, that I, I love this be... one is the downstairs, our children. We spoke about con uh, um, confinement <coughs> with the children because for us that's like the big part of it. <laughs> in our tiny apartment with our two crazy boys is <laughs> Luckily, I'm not fertile. <laughs> yes, you can use the word luckily. I'm not fertile. I agree. Um, no, no, no. On that note, for sure, I can say like between his collaboration and John's collaboration, they're like this. They're like this. Dutch word, Dutch word. Um, yes. Mashallah, mashallah. 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 Thank, you. thank you, Nadia. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, every show that I've either been a part of or been, you know, curating with, I mean, they have both been such fundamental parts of everything, like every step of the way. Uh, you know, then I'd be Amin or John and they'd be facilitating everything. And I, it's not just because I love this one, oh. um, but no, really. Um, <laughs> I pay her to say this. <laughs> <laughs> this is not sponsored. <laughs> no. uh, yeah. They've really got all the grounds covered because they've got that much experience and they teach us in, in this period of- no, no, okay, no. Okay, we're going to move on to Richard now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Nan, would you like to say something? Say something profound and wonderful. <laughs> Nan? Who, me? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. It's a question for uh, I mean, and Sarah. It's a, it's a question about... Um, so you, uh, I was wondering when you put together the, the two exhibitions I was involved in, because of the 
the kind of completely distributed and uh, and media communicated way of forming it. What do you think? What's is there anything distinct about this way of making exhibitions that? Um, how, yeah, what's distinct about them to the ways that, to the the means and ways you've been making exhibitions before? So, for example, the, the first Biennale, Karachi Biennale, there was an enormous amount of discussion between artists, and they got to meet, okay. and they actually got to see spaces. So, this process, which essentially is an I office-based desk based have, process, I mean, I do it because there's there's no other way of doing things at this moment. But it's, it's despite positive. the fact you hate it, what's positive about it? What, <laughs> what, what has, <laughs> no. <laughs> what's positive is we, I mean we can all have sort of a Benetton moment at the moment you know we can all be together and um, and that something can happen um, but still this I mean I go back to the body I mean I remember uh, when Nyan came down and we were all part of this workshop we went to get haircuts and um, yeah, the guy yeah. turned to me and said, oh my God, are you guys brothers? And we touched each other. I mean, was <coughs> wonderful. No, I'm, I'm a completely virtual human being. I'm so basic. So for me, uh, not to communicate uh, with people, not to see real life audiences, it's extremely frustrating. And even though you get likes on Facebook uh, or whatever, it doesn't mean anything, uh, strangely enough. But... Uh, I mean, what else, you know, these are the parameters of these times. So one works within them. Uh, uh, I'm still, yes, I miss, I miss, the, I miss. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I suppose what occurred to me that if you put, particularly with Trojan Donkey, if you put together an institutional exhibition that showed uh, 80 plus artists right. uh, on some with multi-channel, multi-screen, multi-sound installation, that you would need between fifty and one hundred and fifty thousand pounds just to start going. <laughs> and if you ask, if you, then, but, but, but there's a double there's a double side to that because in our solitude we're also becoming um, uneconomical objects. Well, I am anyway. Many of us are, not all of us. But I was just thinking about this this relation between uh, the product, which becomes uh, expressed in in the Facebook channel or the Zoom channel or however it's, however it's platformed and it's a uh, separation from practice in a way. So uh, I was imagining that um, the uh, administrative element of putting on a very ambitious exhibition, which these both have been extremely ambitious exhibition becomes the very thing. Yeah. It's a process of administration. And I thought that's kind of, curious because it then becomes radically curatorial in fact to as a curator you become responsible to look after the administration yeah. and uh, so I guess to go back to my question in because you've managed you between the four the three or four of you and five of you in, in the Trojan donkey right. what did you what what additional stuff did you get you possibly wouldn't have got in another using another um a more traditional method, as it were? Well, I suppose we got love, man. Tremendous amounts of... No, we did! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get any bodily fluids, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. um, I suppose also, um, you know, after Lal Jadu happened, and that was the first of the, as I mean, calls it Corona Chronicles, right? Um, Lal Jada was never supposed to be online. It was yes. supposed to be a live show, right? And not even, I believe, 24 hours before the show, the opening, uh, Karachi was in lockdown. So we had to literally, within a few hours, think of alternate ways of exhibiting this show and still going through with it. That's right. And when we came to the second show that we created in this pandemic, which was the Trojan Donkey, you know, suddenly like the thoughts and ideas of making it more, um, more tightly curated came about being. Um, and then that's also when we expanded of not just having, you know, it was still a quintessential performance show, but it wasn't just national, but it was international as well. And it was not just live performances, but also re recorded 
uh, that we were throwing out on Facebook. Um, so we were thinking of different ideas of how to address the situation that we were in and how art was being seen as. Also, Lao Jadu was supposed to be a real event, yes. which was supposed to be visceral uh -huh. and experiential. Uh -huh. And so when, when it was forced to go on to live feed, we said, fine, let's just take sort of this format of this sort of like a personal, the internet, you know, yeah. Facebook, <laughs> and 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 yeah. throw ourselves, yeah. immerse ourselves into that medium, uh, and that was that. That was the first time, and then Trojan Donkey the second, and of course, you know, with if these walls could uh, healing, and then if these walls could talk, um, and we learn along the way. I mean, it wasn't, and that's why it was so pleasurable to do if these walls could talk yeah. because it was a real event. Yes, I'm I'm very old fashioned. There's a crossover between the two, right? And then that way people could come yeah. in their bubbles. They could remain in the cars. The uh, people of all ages could come because they these are the people they've been quarantining with. Families could come in their cars and watch it. And I can't tell you how pleasurable that yeah. was to put something in real time as well uh, out for the audience in Karachi. Heidi, um, yes. <laughs> Would you like to say some, uh, something, please? I, I, I wanted to, to uh, first. I want to thank you. I love the both the the project and that you invited us and what you made out of it was really incredible and I absolutely loved it and it helped me actually to deal with um, uh, the pandemic because it had to, just it had a, quite a, a bigger impact on me than I would have ever expected. I thought this is perfect, this pandemic, because I can be, I can just stay at home. I'm not interrupted by anybody. And I can, I can produce like crazy. I can probably produce three times as much as I normally do. And I'm producing normally already quite a bit. And it didn't work at all. Absolutely not. I, I need, I needed, um, I, it, it seems I need people around me and I, um, need this what um, what was the um, who said that was that Yo Nayan who said um, uh, you can't get pregnant pregnant when um, um, who said that I uh, apologize it's, it's very crumbly <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just so um, I I really need touch and I need that much more than I had expected. And to kind of be pulled out of this isolation. Um, and I, I agree also with um, Tassin that I don't, I didn't feel lonely and I still don't feel lonely at all. I feel isolated in a way that my body um, is, is uh, it wants something. I mean, I'm really missing something even when I have relationships with people on Zoom or Facebook, uh, I mean, whatever. And um, and therefore I, I found it so nice that with this, um, with these events, we were kind of pulled, pulled back and, and understand that there is, ac that there are actually people there. And, um, and what I also liked is that it was not I was also invited to other things, but that these were performances and that they are, your body could do something or that you were um, supposed to do something with your body that was totally helpful. I think if it was just a um, an invitation for a show, it would have been different for me. And, and therefore, I, I'm, I'm really thankful for what you did because it, it really helped me. And um, I, I was also very honored that you said I should um, uh, contrib contribute something to the um, catalog. And I also love that you make these catalogs. It's, it, it, also, this, this physical thing is all, always extremely important to me. And, and these catalogs make me feel like something is, is more real. And this reality is, is what I'm missing now in some way. So for um, I had I had thought about um, what walls um, mean and that we have basically we apply this um, um, uh, uh, there there are two models of societies or 
politics or economics or sociology or philosophy or psychology or anthropology or even in literature, if these two models, a bridge model and a wall model. And um, of course, it, it, even the, the, in the medieval um, castles, they have realized that and combined it to make it even a, a kind of better model. And the bridge model implies openness and sharing and integration and uh, communication and um, perhaps a, a erosion of identity, while the wall model um, suggests isolation, uh, tribalism, uh, privacy, secrecy, um, and and protection, and um, I, I I'm this you, you know what I'm just read my essay in the um, mm -hmm. <laughs> thing, but because I want to say something else. What I found so interesting is that um, uh, it, it fit. I think it fit the, this subject fits so wonderful to um, to the pandemic because. We are now basically uh, surrounded by walls, and nothing is there but walls. And this, the the the, the only um, thing that here is what we are doing and sees what we are doing is now um, um, kind of impersonal, a wall. And and I also thought before before I had um, came up with this with these two uh, thinking about these two models. Um, that um, the this secrecy, which we um, which we or this this protective protectedness, which we feel um, to be just by ourselves and uh, protected by walls, protected in a way that we can do whatever we want and nobody will see it. Um, this secrecy is something what is not necessarily something what is uh, good for us. I, I I read a lot about because I first wanted to write about that about secrecy and how, what that does to us and um, and it's it's uh, psychologically kind of harmful to have secrets and. Um, and I wanted to, with my performance, where I'm climbing up this wall and then falling down, if you that, that there are risks involved in um, uh, in walls, which sorry, I had something with my eye, um, with walls which are um, um, uh, now I lost the thread. Um, okay. well, I. The the, um, the when you have to um, to keep a secret, which is is also something what um, brings you apart from other people, and and I I just found that so so perfect this subject for a pandemic. Yes. So. Not only for I, the pandemic, but for these times. Yeah. Richard, would you yeah. like to say something about secrets, walls, and bridges? Uh, well, I'd like to actually go back a little bit to what we talked about and what Haida brought up recently. First off, hi, Haida. It's been a while. Hi. Nice <laughs> How are you? It's great to see you. Um, you know, the, the, the original, the first uh, movie that I created for you guys back in, in May, I guess, was the deadline for it was really a kind of like a salvation in a certain way for me because I, I had uh, my, all my shows were canceled this year. I mean, in the, the year started out to be supposedly going to be, you know, a, a year of exhibitions and everything. And then everything I had was canceled. I was doing a show in Dubai. I was going to do a show in Italy, uh, be there for about a month in Italy installing. And then everything came to a halt. The world seemingly was, looking like it was going to end up being like a zombie movie. This is back in March. Nobody knew what was happening, truly. And then I got an email from you asking to create a short film. And I had been, again, I live in Brooklyn. And I had been at my Woodstock house, though, which I bought many, many years ago. It's a couple of bakers in the woods. And as it turned out, 
you know, I was surrounded rather than honking horns and garbage trucks in Brooklyn. I was surrounded for the longest period of time in, in, in Woodstock and up the road from me, from my house is where John Cage in 1952 premiered 433, which is this, you know, famous piece about, uh, you know, the, you basically opens the piano in three acts and do nothing but listen to the sound of the rain and the birds. And that's what I was hearing all the time. And so I created a piece called Cage. It's a four minute and 33 second movie. And I did it for you guys. And that was a salvation for me because I too thought, well, I, I, you know, I live a dichotomous life. I live both one where I'm out constantly, uh, you know, in New York at openings, but I'm also spending a great deal of time uh, in solitude in my studio, but forced solitude did not help. I thought I would be creating a lot of work when in fact, it was difficult to get myself together to create. When I've done residencies, like when I lived in Korea, I lived on an island in Daebudo for three months and basically isolated an hour and a half south of uh, Seoul in, in the Yellow Sea. But I knew it was coming to an end. When this went down, we had no idea if it was going to end. We still don't know reality what's going to happen with this. I'm still living, you know, behind. I live in a, a beautiful firehouse in, in Brooklyn and uh, you know, my studio's here, but I'm trapped inside the wall behind. I'm literally trapped in here or I'm trapped in my car driving to, to Woodstock. And so anyway, it was, a, it was an amazing opportunity. And I latched onto that with all the energy I could muster to, to do that. And the same with If These Walls Would Talk, because it was something that gave me purpose you know, and, and for, I just wanted to thank you for that, you know, and, and uh, I utilized it to the very best of my ability. Well, you know, Richard, in both, in both I, instances. I mean, Richard, I would like to thank not only you, but all the other yeah. artists, because you all have been my salvation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Seriously, sure. you've been my salvation sitting in, you know, shithole Karachi, Pakistan. You know, you have been my salvation. And thank <laughs> you, you know, to all of them who've been part of this journey of the, you know, the Corona Chronicles. And like anything I do in life, nothing is really planned. One thing organically leads to the other. And I'm so extremely, extremely grateful to all of you that have participated not only tonight for this uh, webinar, but just for all the Chronicles, for yeah. Lal Jadu Red Magic, for the Trojan Donkey, for uh, if these walls could talk and for my own personal performance, the healing too. And I'm so extremely, extremely grateful. And I think at a time like this, it is really important that we should all talk, communicate and exchange. Agreed. And although I really would like to touch each and every one of <laughs> you, and thank you too, you know, uh, I would, uh, I really would. But um, luckily, mm. You all, I cannot. <laughs> and um, I would really thank you so very much. Yeah. Sarah, Phoebe? Um, and just to end with, you know, I'd just like to add a few words um, that anomalies which might have elsewise seemed really bizarre don't anymore. Um, and these strange times, I, I suppose they really make you think about the finer things of life, which you elsewise wouldn't really give much time or thought to. And I'd really, from the bottom of the bottom of my heart, really, really like to thank all of you. I am so, so grateful to all of you to making all of this, this entire journey uh, possible. Possible. Yes. Yeah. Thank you all. So, thank, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Wherever you're coming from. Kisses, love, PR. Bye bye. <laughs> love, 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 love. Thank you, all. you so thank much. You so thank much. you, thank you, thank you. And let's pray that we soon touch. Yes. For sure. Yes. For sure. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. bye.